So we're going to talk about investment and investing and investors, particularly in the space business, particularly in the personal and commercial spacecraft business. So I'll start down the row here, and if you folks would like to take turn. Um, in to, to, I think, Tom, we said. Am I first or last? Yes. Whatever you'd like me to do, Wayne. Let's, I think we picked, uh, I think we picked uh, Peter first, didn't we? We had Stephen first. Okay, mm -hmm. see, we're Either already way. out of order. <laughs> Take it away, guys, great. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity and the honor to present today and talk on a panel. Um, I would also be biased and say, I wish we were first, but then that would make me very sleepless because a lot of people would be talking to us about uh, how to get this going, but that's the intention of this show, correct? Um, so, the fun part was uh, I leveraged my technical background. I started with a master's in double E, went the traditional route, uh, worked in technology, and then got pulled to the dark side. The dark side being sales, uh, got involved with technical sales and running a sales organization and understanding that it's all about the money. It's all about getting to the customer, making a product, getting to a customer, and getting revenue from it. So the fun part after doing sales up and down the food chain in terms of running sales, being an individual contributor. I then in, went into operations of uh, software companies, uh, one of them in India, one of them in China. Um, had a lot of fun doing that, understanding the international challenges with uh, each of the countries. Um, decided to, two years ago, start a relationship uh, based on trust with uh, a good high school friend and college friend to put together an angel investing network. What we wanted to do was leverage our relationships with our friends, our high net worth friends, and enable them to, alongside with us, invest in opportunities that are always clever, but investable, meaning they're businesses, not just ideas, with some execution ability or track record. Um, we went along and did pretty much, um, I'd say about a half a dozen deals or so in all types of markets, and then came along an opportunity to look at new space. Um, it's, it's a long story, but the short version of it, my future stepdaughter uh, is aspiring to be an astrophysicist, and as a result, I got introduced through my personal connections, introducing her to NASA. Long story short, we put an MOU together with CASIS, and really are enjoying our relationship with CASIS. And for those of you that don't know, CASIS basically um, manages the uh, national lab, if I'm saying that right, uh, on the space station. Uh, through CASIS, we're able to look at opportunities both um, ground-based uh, projects that are looking at microgravity impact, um, and we're getting exposed to other things that CASES has been looking at, like the Mass Challenge, um, and as a result, we were able to invest in uh, NanoRacks, for example. Uh, we're about to close the relationship with Worldview. So we're super excited about uh, making an impact in, in new space, um, and I think we'll probably talk about more about wh what we invest in and why, right? Thank you, Stefan. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, um, as you mentioned, Wayne, already, I'm a, I'm a high energy infusion physicist with a, with a big interest uh, in space. Unfortunately, commercial space uh, didn't really exist when I, when I graduated. And so I, uh, I followed my business interest first with some consulting and, and, and an MBA and some uh, um, investment management before uh, realizing that there is a dramatic shift and a dramatic change happening in the space industry. Um, that there are on one hand, uh, people in their 30s that have already made their mark, not only in creating businesses that are some of which are the largest in the world, but also have more money than God and wanting to figure out how they can really move mankind forward. Um, and people like you know, uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Paul Allen um, reached literally for the stars. Um, and that is like the first factor that I think changed when I decided to leave investment management and, uh, and start a space company. I think the second factor that is happening is that the, uh, our governments uh, all across the world, maybe with the exception of China, uh, are running low on cash last time I checked. Um, and so more and more of the uh, traditional burden in, in space exploration has been shouldered by the governments, aka the, the taxpayer. And I think we are seeing now a situation where that purse is getting tighter and tighter, um, which creates opportunities for the private sector, where instead of the government operating large and costly assets, the private sector is taking that over and offering competitive services to the government. 
Uh, I think you know the the first and most foremost example there would be SpaceX, where instead of uh, operating and owning the space shuttle, um, the government can now purchase from SpaceX uh, a far more affordable service, and actually only pays if it performs well. Right, the space shuttle was a cost independent of its performance. Um, SpaceX is a, is a supplier, and you only have to pay if it actually works. Um, and the third component that I think is happening, I think that's what um, uh, Stephen had mentioned already with the, with the word new space, is that there is a, an entirely new, um, I would say, group of technologies that have entered the space industry uh, that new space companies are leveraging. You know, the, the advent of smaller and smaller satellites at uh, same or sometimes even higher capabilities um, all the way down to nanosatellites um, uh, is, is just like a, a dramatic technology shift uh, from what uh, it used to take to, to put um, stuff or people into space. And that's why we started the company, and I think that, that change is something that not only the entrepreneurs start to see, but also the investment community has been highly interested in. Very good, thank you. And Tom? So I just was asked to share some thoughts on what it takes to raise uh, a, a significant amount of capital uh, for space-related ventures. Uh, I've done several. Some have been successful, some have not. Um, I think raised about $140, $150 million of, of financing from angels, um, from Series A to uh, traditional venture capital and even private equity money, and, and, and has have negotiated some, some, some debt as well. Um, and there's a number of themes that I've kind of learned pretty much the hard way since there's not a lot of people in our industry that do this. Uh, so I thought, just thought I'd share a couple of key, key insights that I've gained. I think number one is, um, to, to Wayne's point, when we get started with these ventures, you gotta have a financing plan. You know, no bucks, no bucks, Rogers. And uh, the very first business plan we put together, um, we had all these great engineering work that we had done and these great designs and we showed it to our investors and they go, hey, that looks great. So you want X amount of money, then what are you gonna do when that money runs out? I'm like, um, go get some more. And uh, so they, they really wanted to see if a, a financing plan that was as developed as our engineering plan. And I think that's one thing that we as engineers tend not to do. We tend to think about the technical execution challenges when you need to think through the financing plan as well, soup to nuts, the whole thing. Now, it think, it'll change along the way, but at least need to have a plan when the question gets answered. Um, I think the second thing that, that really hit me was the quality of the money. I think you wanna be very, very careful uh, who you take money from. Um, all money is not green, believe it or not. Um, I learned that lesson a number of ways, but as you get, as you need to raise larger and larger money, larger amounts of money, the people that were the first ones in are gonna matter a lot. Um, if, if the people, they're not the kind of people other folks wanna hang with, or they're not gonna feel comfortable associating with, they're not gonna put their money in. Um, so you really wanna be careful to attract smart capital, or at least um, you know, capital with a strong positive reputation. A uh, number of instances early on when we were trying to raise money, we had people ready to write checks and some of our early investors go, no, we're not taking that money because if we take that money, that may prevent us from getting other, other kinds of monies. And uh, it's, it's a real fact. You want to get the smartest money you can because smart money <coughs> attracts smart money and more money. Uh, I think the third thing that I learned is that when you're out raising money for a space venture, you're not competing against other space ventures. You know, I thought, well, you know, this is a really, really good space venture because it's not in a kind of low risk, we don't need all that much money, and it's way better than all the other ones. But what I realized was that, well, they were really competing against, we were competing against social media. And we were competing against, you know, turns out a Ponzi scheme. Some one of our guys passed on us and invested in a Ponzi scheme. Uh, we had a group of investors that, um, did our, that didn't do Series B on Skybox because they did GoPro. Um, so you gotta think through the overall quality of the investment that your investment thesis, the potential return, the changes you're gonna make um, has to have a fairly broad appeal because again, the money you're, you're out competing against uh, every investment opportunity out there, not just space. And, um, and the other one is, is you know, uh, you wanna make sure your investors have a passion. And we heard about that earlier today, it's been, been talked about that a little bit today. Uh, this afternoon, uh, some about it yesterday. Uh, but you don't always know what that passion is, and someone might say no to you, but that doesn't mean you have a great idea. You just keep looking, but you just gotta find the passion. Uh, one of our ventures, we actually had Warburg Pincus, a $32 billion private equity firm, lead our Series B round with an $11 million check. And we never could quite figure out why they were willing to do it, but we took their money because they were smart money. Um, and luckily, we gave them more money back than they took. But 
after a while, we got to know him pretty well. And the reason they invested was because we had some astronauts on our board. And it was, we were literally New York Park Avenue cocktail party fodder. Hmm. You know, they just like to talk about this cool thing they were doing. And okay, scratch the itch, but we got it done. And we've had a number of opportunities like that where, you know, there, there, there's a purpose and a focus. Um, and that also links to um, one of the things that I think we need to make sure we, don't, we do not do in this industry is that we become isolated. But as we, as the more we branch out and to get part, and participate, and participate in other industries and become, um, have other people become dependent on us, that improves our, improves our chances of success. So if you get strategic partners that are gonna depend on your success, larger companies that see you as critical to their growth, um, some key customers that see you as critical to um, a potential product that they want to put out and put put in place. That's they're going to they're going to work to help you be successful. When you have a challenge, they're going to come to your to come come to your aid. Um, the two m meaningful exits that I participated in were both customers and or early investors who had become so involved in us and become dependent on our success they realized that they couldn't allow someone else to own us because we were too important to what they were doing going forward. So think strategically about how you fit into that, into, that, uh, into the overall um, economic infrastructure um, and, and put yourself in a spot that you make other people successful uh, when you succeed and they'll be dependent on you. Um, and, and last but not least, I think, um, I talked about it earlier about the importance of execution, that um, you're only gonna get more money if you do what you say and Obviously, we're going to have challenges along the way. You're going to want to be honest about those challenges, but um, you need to have a plan that you can actually do. And, um, and I think with that, I think we have, we have an opportunity to really do some amazing things in this industry. So I'd like to explore a little bit of the things that you've mentioned. And one of the terms that we've heard over and over again today and in previous discussions about personal and commercial spacecraft from the government officials is that they look to companies that have skin in the game, skin in the game. They're supposed to be private investment. And sometimes I think my colleagues in government think that that money is just gonna be given and nothing expected in return. In fact, the way business works is you make an investment and after a period of time you get your principal back and make a profit. I mean, that's kind of business economics 101, if I understand it. So as we look to venture capitalists in this arena, uh, what kind of uh, return on investment do you typically find that they're looking for and what kind of time frame? Is it, as people have said, uh, 30 percent in three to five years or, or is there, uh, a, it, it varies from investor to investor? What, what would you say about that? You know, the expected return on investment from uh, venture capitalists. So um, there is, uh, I don't know if anyone has read the, the new book from Peter Thiel. Um, he talks about uh, the returns in the venture capital industry, and there's a lot of uh, writing that Andreessen has recently done on that one as well. Um, basically, the way investment returns are structured is that they are not normally distributed, but they follow what is called the power law, right? So something like 90% of the return comes from one or two investments, right? So sometimes even less than 10% of the fund. Um, now that creates an interesting uh, dilemma for venture capital companies, right? Because the larger the fund is, that underlying law doesn't change. But if the fund is $20 million, they can invest in things that return $20 million. If the fund is a billion dollars, they need to only invest in companies that have at least the potential to return a billion dollars. So with the fund size, the um, opportunity space to invest scales up and down dramatically. Um, that's one of the reasons why we've seen so many micro funds um, with, the, with the bubbling and mushrooming of like literally hundreds of micro funds that are in the you know, 20 to, to maybe $50 million range I think one of, of Tom's comments comes into play again, um, not all money is green, right? And some of that you, you, you don't want to take, right? Um, uh, and so that then becomes like an interesting dilemma. But the return that they ask for is they basically need every single investment needs to have the potential to return the full fund size for their economics given the distribution of returns work. So, so 10x. 
not not 30%. They're okay. looking for, you know, a couple hundred percent per year if they can get it. You know, so it's multiples of the money. So if they put in one, you know, in, in most venture funds, they have a five year, seven year I'm on the out on the long side. That's a long, long investment. You know, they're looking for seven, ten x return on their money. And, and from the angel side, it's uh, it's a little different. The order of magnitude of the investment is smaller. So it's kind of like bankroll management at the crafts table. So you want to make sure that you have enough money to invest in the series of things you're going to invest in. 10x is a good return. And based on that, you want to at least have one out of 10 succeed, right? So it's, it's similar, except the, it's a different order of magnitude. So, so in this business that we all love, the space business, it's a high risk, low payoff, and there haven't been a lot of jackpots. Why do venture capitalists invest in, these, in this field, other than having astronauts come to their cocktail parties? I, so from the angel side, um, I think leveraging the passion idea. So there's a passion play uh, and a smart play. So maybe it's someone that, that was involved with a successful exit from an aerospace company. or uh, So they're, they're willing to take their money and help out entrepreneurs, blooming entrepreneurs, or potential successful serial entrepreneurs to take the company to the next level. So it's, 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 it's passion, I think. I, mean, I think we have to be able to demonstrate a return. I think if we can't, then we won't get venture capital. So I think we need some folks to be able to return 10x the money. Um, otherwise, it will dry up. And I think that's very, very important for all of us to understand that it's, you know, it's capitalism. Right? And they're, they're chasing the best return. And if they think they can get it in space, they will. If they can't, they'll go somewhere else. And I think that there's, you know, SpaceX has been a tremendous catalyst, was a great catalyst for us, because we could go out and say, hey, look, here's somebody who's put private capital to work, and there's some significant return there. Um, I think Skybox, and we had a very meaningful exit at Skybox, um, and I think that's going to be very positive. I know that uh, Peter's already contacting, in contact with some of the Skybox investors, but that's got them catalyzed, right? That's got them excited about that. Um, and so, anything other thing that, that space holds for, uh, for, for the investment community, I think is an important point. A lot of these funds have a tremendous amount of money, um, especially the private equity funds. We, when we were doing our Series C, we had a lot of firms that wouldn't even consider an investment under $50 million. And that was the minimum check size. And they were hoping that over the life of the, the, the company, they could put to work 150 or 200 million because they've got a multi-billion dollar fund Right? And they've got to put that money to work, and they don't want to put it to work in $2 million chunks. It's just too hard. So they want to write big checks. So one of the values, and I think one of the strengths that our industry has, is it does provide the opportunity to put meaningful money to work. And, and if you have a plan that is, the, and you're executing along that plan, um, the fact that you're going to need you know, a $50 million check and then a $100 million check is a real positive. I can tell you that we were negotiating with a number of investors in, 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 in concert with our Google discussions because uh, we needed several hundred million dollars more, and that was a really good thing. And they were all excited about being able to put a lot more money to work. Yeah, in the, in the investment management world, um, uh, we used to say, uh, beware of driving with your view in the rear view mirror. Um, and I think your comment about, oh, you know, space, you know, um, no one has made any money in space, and the old joke, you know, how do you make, you know, a uh, million dollar in space is, you know, you start with a billion dollar and, and work your way downwards. <laughs> um, I, I think that's like driving with the rear from mirror, right? Um, and, and, to, and to Tom's point, you know, this is exactly what happened. You know, rookie mistake here. You know, I walked into after our, our round has closed into like a, um, a later stage investor, and they ask, "So when are you going to raise money again?" And I said, "I don't know. Maybe in three, four years, and I maybe raise another, you know, ten million dollars, something like that." And all the faces fell down. And when I walked out, I got yelled at by some of my partners and said, how can you say that? You should say in 12 months and it's going to be $50 million minimum, right? Because they have those large funds You've got to put and it like to work. telling them, which is like counterintuitive for like, you know, a conservative person to tell them I will need a lot of money, but it's actually what they want to hear if you have a business that then returns an investment on that money. Wow. I'm learning a lot here. Go ahead. And um, so again, VC, VC money, but <laughs> angel money. So as an angel, you're accountable to yourself. You're investing your own money. As a VC, you're accountable to the LPs that gave you the money to invest. So again, maybe the, to narrow it down, in addition to passion, the idea is you're, you're, you're making an impact in the world. You're making some kind of, something's gonna happen somewhere because of that investment that's positive for someone 
but financially positive too for you. So it's, we're not we're not charity. So very good. Let's see. I'm looking for questions from the audience. Do we have any questions, Shirley, on this topic? Nobody needs fifty million dollars. <laughs> Okay. Well, let me uh, let me uh, if if you have a question, write it down, and the and the folks will bring it up here to me. But let me let me follow up with uh, one more. We we've talked quite a lot about private public partnerships and government involvement, and there seems to be a trend away from investing in um, programs or companies that are heavily involved with the government. Kind of a divorce from that. Do you see that trend going on and the venture capitalists want to invest in companies that are uh, perhaps less involved with government programs? Uh, I, <clears throat> having done a number of those, uh, there's some pros and cons to the government. What we have found is that a lot of the venture community isn't smart enough to pick winners. They don't know how to do that. And so if you're in a government competition and you win a contract, that to them sprinkles some, it anoints you, right? It's holy water that you technically know what you're doing because they can't make that decision. So if you can go in and say, hey, you know, we know what we're doing and we can prove to you because we have this government contract or whatever, that goes a long way. Where venture capital really struggles is relying on a government market. If you go in and say, hey, I want VC money because I'm gonna go win these government contracts, I'm gonna become a big government contractor, you're kind of wasting your time. Uh, so the government can play an important role of being, um, a technology validation arm organization, but my experience is that you know venture and um, especially private equity money is, isn't going to be interested in in making a bet on government as a market. And, and from the angel side, um, government money or grants, non dilutive funding is a good thing for us to look at. It's free money, take it. A lot of it, especially in Colorado, it's a two to one match, so they require. If you get a 250 grant, you have to raise 500 on the angel side. So we're happy to we're happy to see that. Good. Okay. Well, we got a couple of questions from the audience, so I'll follow up with those. How would you go about creating a viable valuation of a new space firm? Something that some of us don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't give away all your secrets. <laughs> Seriously, have we got some criteria that you use or things you look for? I mean, there, there, stand, there are standard valuation metrics, right? Um, and it's, it's how big of a hockey stick you can draw and, you know, and how much technology you can bring to bear and how much market you can demonstrate. But it really is, uh, to Peter's point, it's kind of a thumb in the wind and it, it's market driven, right? You're out raising money and you say, well, I'll sell 30% of my company for $5 million and some guys, well, I'll give you a million bucks for 80% of your company, you know, it's, and, and so you just try and find, work, find the best deal you can. And, and we look at use of funds, so whatever the ask is, we make sure that it's not for helicopter rides back and forth between different cities, but uh, <laughs> understanding that it's going to go and be applied towards a certain revenue criteria, and as Tom was saying, there's a bunch of different, like half a dozen different formulas, different ways of doing bell curves or whatnot, so it ha has to be somewhat this way, but... <laughs> I mean, I, I was only making this like half jokingly actually, right? Because surprisingly enough, especially like in the seed stage, there actually is a market price, right? Um, because as Tom said before, and you're not competing with other new space companies, right? Uh, that's no one, that's no, very few angels are gonna compare you to like, okay, I can invest in this new space and this new space, right? They're gonna uh, compare you to the about 30 emails that they get per day um, uh, of different uh, ventures that they can invest in. And especially in a seed stage, um, if you're somewhat like reasonable, there actually is a, is a market price and you can actually find it out if you have, for example, you go through like a reputable incubator or you have like a, a, a top angel investor already there. Um, they can actually tell you like, yeah, you know, currently people raise, you know, um, you know, at you know, 5 million pre 20% discount or yeah, it's now gone to like 4 million, you know, uh, and then you can shop it around a little bit, but to some degree, at least personally for us, I never was concerned with valuation. I was far more concerned with like who the money is coming from. Is that person you know reputable, and is that person passionate about our success, right? Because I think there are too many investors that uh, too many entrepreneurs, especially the young ones, that are very very focused on how big is the you know my slice of the pie, right? But the outcome for you as an entrepreneur is driven by the multiplication of three numbers. What is the size of the pie? 
What is my slice of the pie? And what's the probability that the pie appears in front of me? Right? In the, the slice one is actually like the least relevant one, right? You have a great investor, the pie is going to be 10 times as large, and your probability just doubled. Right? So focus on the pie appearing and not dreaming about a pie that never appears or is so small that it doesn't care that you own 80% of it. Right? The quality of the money is, is really key, overvaluation. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. We're going to run out of time here, I can tell. I'll just ask one more question. To get a 10 times return on investment, are there any business plans executed with an acquisition strategy as the final stage? In other words, I'm going to build it and sell it to somebody else. Sure. Outside. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of ways to get a return. And uh, I think as you evolve, you need to understand what, what is the right strategy for you. Um, my feeling is you need options, right? Because options create value. Okay. If you don't, if you're not focused on just one outcome or dependent on one outcome, it then allows you to trade up and, and, uh, and get a little bit of competition going to increase valuation. So um, optionality is, is, I think, the key. But one option is exit, but I don't, that's not the only one. OK. Well, the clock lady says we have five more minutes. So All I'm right. Keep going. Bonus. Apparently, everybody's interested in this. Um, <laughs> this is a question for me. It says, do you think the lack of questions indicates that most of the audience know how to spend money already? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I would say that I, I believe this audience knows how to spend money. The question is, how do you raise money? And I think that's what we're up here talking about. I, I, uh, okay, I got that one. Um, how do you see investments in space medicine and space health technologies evolving? Is that something that you've heard about or looks promising? Oh, absolutely. Life sciences and, and being based in Colorado, too. Life sciences is pretty key, a, a key hot and happening opportunity for investors and, and seed stage investors. So yes, I, I vote yes on that one. Um, I have uh, not done any investing there myself, but what I have seen is actually both ways. So I have seen people that have taken space technology um, where the design criteria of having to do something with very low power, with very, very little interaction from the astronauts because they are like you know, very, very tight schedules, created the technology that um, I think that particular case is, is around uh, sequencing um, uh, proteins, basically allows to bring that back from space on Earth and then apply it on Earth in like a huge billion dollar industry. Very good, very good. Okay, there used to be a problem of investors doing due diligence by asking NASA about the technical feasibility. We talked about getting a government award, but this is NASA doing a technical feasibility but with the associated conflict of interest, does this still happen or are we beyond this conflict of interest stage? We've had um, four sets of due diligence done on us and uh, each of the investors contract with their own you know, folks and typically they're industry experts that have set up little consulting firms to do something, to do due diligence for investors. So I think there's a, there's a little cottage community out there that does it and our experience, frankly, is they do a pretty decent job. And uh, so I think we're, we're beyond that, the NASA validation side. And, and Angel side, uh, it's diligence light. So uh, it's not the thousand questions that you would ask normally because at the end of the day, we're trying to be really respectful to the entrepreneur. They have a business to run. Uh, if they're sitting there answering a billion questions from everybody they ask money for, they'll never be able to, they'll, they'll lose their energy to, to run the company. So that's the, our angel perspective. I find it interesting that um, it is coined as conflict of interest with NASA, right? Um, at least for us, that has not been my experience. Um, uh, I think there's plenty of incredibly passionate people, you know, Pete Warden from NASA Ames comes to mind, um, uh, but also from the other centers, right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always getting like a little bit um, anxious when people phrase it as like, you know, either or, you know, old space or new space or, you know, government or new space. I think it is significantly more and rather than actually a conflict of interest. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Well, looking up here, it seems like we need the investors on fly removal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, there is an, a laser sapper. Yeah. <laughs> they have built that. There you go, high tech. Yeah. Um, this has, uh, I think, truly really been a very interesting and great discussion. 
Uh, I know uh, Arian's going to tell us that we're going to go on a break. Don't leave yet, but we'll be able to take some more questions out in the portico if you're, if you're interested. I would just leave you with the thought uh, as we go out. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer, and I love space and rockets and airplanes and, and making smoke and you know, all this stuff. Um, and uh, I grew up reading Avweek magazine. I guess I can talk about them because they're not here. And lately, I, I've noticed that in Avweek magazine, all the letters are to the editor are, why, why do you quit writing about airplanes and all you're writing about is the business and the money and the investments? And, the, and, and, uh, and I think that's a sign of a maturing industry um, because as we look forward to doing perhaps great things in space and, and flying millions of people or whatever we're going to do, um, someday it's going to be a business, and, uh, and uh, the engineer and you may not be quite as excited about it, but that is the way it needs to go. And it all starts with investment and making a profit. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.